Hey, that's great news about uh, that grant. Yeah. No match. Just go do your thing. Ah. All right, we'll go ahead and get started, guys. Uh, <laughs> you just walked in. Um, Welcome to the uh, September 2nd meeting of the Business and Community Affairs Committee. Uh, I believe that we have two items on today's agenda. The first being uh, the landscaping at the Central Library, and I believe staff has a presentation on that. We do. I don't know if we want, does everyone have some background information as to why we're even talking about this? Do I need to go into that as far as yes. kind of what we've been tasked with? And, and Brenda's here in the room, so she can vouch for this. I don't know if you want to start it, Brenda. But, uh, the, uh, <laughs> The Central Library landscape is a uh, controversial topic. Um, there's extremes on either way, so whether it should look like it looks or whether it should be all mowed down. And we, we think there's a middle ground that we're trying to hit. But uh, Brenda can kind of speak to how often they get calls about why does it look like that, what even is it, that kind of thing. Um, and the library can vouch the other way, saying there's so many people that appreciate it and love it and think that there's great things going on. So um, It's been a, a little bit of a... A learning curve anyway from the very beginning because um, when you when you do a prairie type landscape like this it takes two or three years for it to fully grow out where you can actually see anything before it just doesn't look like sticks um, right over the last summer was the first summer we started receiving complaints uh, through the action center um, this summer they have ramped up considerably and not only complaints about it needing to be mowed. It looked unsightly. Uh, it was traffic hazard when you're trying to pull out there on acres. Um, and also um, co-compliance has been receiving a lot of feedback from homeowners that they are uh, posting their yards for needing to mow about uh, getting their response back from them. Why should we have to mow when you're not taking care of your property. Um, that's been really heavy this summer, much more than before. Um, it's the size that it is right now, it's just way too large of an area to, for us to handle and to maintain and, and make it look you know, presentable. So uh, working with parks, we thought we'd come and, and uh, present something to you about how uh, kind of a happy medium. Things we could do, get some direction. And see um, what council thinks about that. Yeah, real quick before I go, uh, Parks has been doing the maintenance on it through a contractor, so we've had them do some hand pulling of some, some species, because there's, I think in the seed mix that went in, there's about 27 species. As you know, in Oklahoma, you can get about that many to blow in on the wind, and they're very <laughs> successful at seeding themselves and taking over your landscape. Mm -hmm. So there is, there's a compromise, we, we think and we hope. I think we need the, the main point we're trying to look at is maybe stop thinking of it as a prairie and more like a pollinator area because the prairie is a whole different thing. We'll get into some of that. So just starting this presentation, we looked at sort of our public landscapes, and we have several areas in town that are sort of public and uh, native species areas, what we would call them. So for instance, Lindsay Street Bridge, and we've got, uh, we've got uh, grasses, we have uh, sumac, we have some... Uh, you know, the sumac here and the Lindsay Street Bridge, but it's a mix of native and naturalized and just normal uh, out of the nursery landscape. So, you know, junipers, are, there are certain junipers that grow here, but these are uh, Chinese garden junipers. There's uh, black-eyed Susans, there's yuccas in here. So we have successful landscapes in town. This is Main Street Bridge, you get the same thing. Abelias aren't a native species, but here I was for just a few minutes taking pictures and there's a pollen, you know, there's butterflies up there on the Abelia on the Main Street Bridge over I-35. So there's, uh, there's ways to have plant species that are available for, for pollinators. They don't always have to be uh, native species. We, and that is the toughest environment you can have is these two bridges because there's no, you know, the soil's only so deep in the winter. There's nothing but cold air underneath it. It's not, it doesn't have the earth to warm it. It's very hard to grow anything up on those bridges. Uh, if you don't believe me, go to Morgan Road because they tried to do it up there, up in the city, and they took it all out because nothing they planted lived. So we try to learn from that and do better. We have boulders and things in there. Uh, same thing, North Flood. We've been pretty successful replacing a lot of just really um, yard type uh, landscape that used to be in here with grasses and yuccas and prickly pear and boulders and things. It's been pretty, really successful up there. Um, the Altheas aren't doing so good, but they've kind of timed out. And, and everything receives storm damage too. So any landscape we do, 
receives a lot of ice damage, and this gets driven through more than you'd ever imagine, even with the boulders in there. We have people that run over these things, and we go and we do the best we can to replace them, often with contractors. And they're irrigated. You can see the irrigation lines in here. So we do what we can. So start thinking about a prairie, Sam Noble Museum. Okay, it looks like a prairie. And it is. They have this enormous area. But as you get closer to the building, it becomes much more manicured to the point where they have you know, your typical landscape plants. But if you, st if you get on the back end, this is the back side, and you look back out, it is an enormous prairie. That's a successful prairie planting. So it's, it's kind of about your context and, and your ability to have you know, the size you need to have a prairie. So keep that in mind as we head towards the central library. We have the east side library. It's more of a rural setting. Much more, you know, same design team, wasn't it? Same uh, mm -hmm. 10 by 10, everyone. So they, we have sort of a prairie landscape out there, but you, overlook, you stand inside the library and look out over this prairie. I think you get more complaints maybe about the front side where you're coming up and there's the sign as you come off of uh, Alameda. But, you know, the back side, it's, it's a pretty successful area, even though we have been uh, talking to mowing right at the edge. So this, this aesthetic isn't right here up against everything where people are walking in because that was some of the original complaints. But even at that front door are smaller beds that have more typical landscape plants. You know, and they explain, just like we do at the Central Library, there's, there's signs up by the uh, door that explain what's going on and what you're seeing. Those have helped a lot as far as telling people what we're trying to do and why, because some people never go to the library and just drive by and say, why don't you mow? Well, if they'd go up there, they'd see what we're doing. So, Central Library, here's the difference, is we're in an urban context now. So you're trying, I mean, this is a buffalo grass area out here. It's really nice. We've got, you know, public art. It's a public building, but there's housing right up against it. There's major streets right up against it. It's, it's set in an area, I mean, Andrews Park is across the street, but, you know, that's mowed every seven to ten days, and it's got ball field practice and it's all that. So, you're in a different context now. So, we, this is one area right up by the road where we have, you know, done a lot of hand pulling of weeds because what uh, Brenda was talking about, it was a site issue as far as coming out of that main drive, going into the library and not being able to see even oncoming traffic. Um, same thing, there are signs that tell you what's going on. They have even with the 27 species that are in here, they only list, you know, the 11 or so species that are on this sign. So that leads you kind of logically to, well, maybe we're just kind of over-planted, over-ambitious over in what we're trying to do in this urban context, in these small areas, with this enormous number of plants. There's sort of a secondary set of signs right along acres. This is coming out of James Garner and looking west, pulling your neck way out. You can see down there, but if you're actually further back in, you see this. So if you're sitting there, that's going to have to have some kind of modification. By people as we do the uh, Norman Forward project to, uh, to, re to build all that out all the way up to North Flood. So there is a separate um, uh, function of the plantings out here in what they call little canyon gardens. There's sort of some, try I'll get to those, I have drawings of all that. So there is some, some benefit that we're also explaining to people. This, that sign is right here. It's, it's right up here along the sidewalk. So this is maybe a place, and we met and talked here with uh, some of our, our some of the new council members, and this area has more potential to be more understood by the public because you've, you've parked your car, you're walking in, there's signs right up against it that show, you know, talk about what species are, and the library staff themselves have often come out here and uh, done some weeding, done some, you know, helping out. We've had volunteers, not even library staff, just volunteers, that it's easier to get that context because the people that are walking in can read the sign, can understand what's going on, same way with the storm. But even back here, this furthest bed, there's a sign right there telling you the book drop-off is this way, parking's that way, it's almost overgrown with stuff. So, you know, a point to the people saying it's, it's too wild, Yes, um, we can do other things, but you know some of the species in these Maximilian sunflowers, they get to be eight feet tall. They're part of the mix, but there's several other things. There's ragweed, there's cottonwood trees, there's uh, uh, elm trees all over. There's just all sorts of things that are volunteering that we try and stay ahead of. And to that point, we've, we've had our maintenance crews work on this, um, our contract maintenance, and it's tens of thousands of dollars per year to do maintenance to pay that out of our, our contract maintenance account. So, going further along, like there's Legacy Trail. This is sort of the north end. There's the library down there. But you have this little buffer between the parking lot and Legacy Trail where it's very wild. You have the parking lot islands that have a lot of Johnson grass and things that are volunteering coming in. This is looking north, kind of from that same area. This is turning and looking north up Legacy Trail. And that's sort of the point 
the tip point of the uh, parking area. So very wild, I get it, you know, it looks unkempt, but that's sort of the, that's what previous decisions were made to let's grow a prairie. Again, maybe we're shifting to pollinator instead, that's kind of where we're getting at with some of this. So if you look at it, perhaps some solutions, like this is James Garner right here, Acre Street down here, this is the entry. So as you look in, there's the, the uh, uh, art piece right there in that plaza. There's some places where we're probably going to have to do something for traffic's sake. So if you strike a line right here, there's these areas that we probably can, should look towards mowing that down shorter. We can get it back to buffalo grass, but still keep the original triangle canyon type area back towards the drains here, here, and here. This one just happens to architecturally come off that same line as the wall. But these areas in gray and all these next few slides are areas where we would say we keep the tall, you know, the trees and the specimen type species, cut down everything that's super high, uh, wild mix in those gray areas. Leave what's there in these yellow and what was orange, I don't know what color that is, even gold maybe. And then in these greener areas, we propose perhaps like we have in our public landscapes in the medians and on the bridge, remove what's there and go back with some native species, a smaller mix, maybe, maybe eight or 10 plants instead of 27 plants, plus whatever we can't even tell that is in these areas. That's the entry drive, the entry sign. And this area along that edge where the apartments are, just again, mow that back down to a, a shorter tack. Same thing, this is the railroad terrace. You know, this is the railroad tracks along here, along James Garner. We could probably leave a lot of that as is. It's uh, a narrow area. As you keep on heading north, you know, then you transition to this where you'd remove and replant with a limited, more limited palette, things that would act as pollinators, but leave the big area here in the area where the drop off is. So we're here today kind of looking for, the, you kind of see how this is progressing. The, the areas by the front door, these we would leave as is and work again with our volunteers is really tight in stuff to, to keep the sort of the original idea of the sign, what the sign says about why this landscape is like it is, what it's doing, what the pollinators are doing, what we're trying to do here. But then as you start moving north up into the parking lot, that's when you really probably are heading into areas we probably just remove because these have, uh, well, this is the one right against the uh, uh, fences. The next one is uh, the parking lots. We have these drainage swales that are essentially rock areas in between, you know, cars park here and here is a normal parking lot. But they're extremely tall with a lot of sunflower, a lot of other plants. These we would go back and the trees are there. We, talk, we, we, just, we figured this out. The trees that are in the parking lot because the city Norman code requires there be trees, the parking lot. So the trees will stay but maybe cut back the, the wild species in here and go back to the, keep the rock, the drainage, but then do like some pocket plantings of some specimen pollinators in here and really cut back that. Cause that's, that's one of the big complaints I think Brendan and them get is I park my car, I can't see across to the other car. You know, this seems crazy. Why aren't you mowing anything here? But we keep the tips of the islands. This is miscolored. These tips we could keep in the buffalo grass and the more native species in here, 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 and here. So, and then getting really, I'm zoomed out to the large parking bay, same thing, just remove all the wild stuff in between here, keep the tips in the native stuff. I think Wade said they're already maintaining this with sort of a mow, a combination. This is a big cell tower right here. And then you keep moving further and further up to the very tip, and that's where we would kind of cut back to the lower species, leave the trees, maybe remove and replant some of this area right here, sort of a specimen garden right here. But that's sort of taking the idea Kind of went through those fast, but I think everyone knows what I'm talking about. Taking the idea of public landscapes with native species combined with other species that are good pollinators, where we can replace those in some of the areas, look for the site triangles where you can't see coming out, kind of cut back those areas, but leave some portions of this to, if we go with this type of plan, again, talking to Wade, our, our park maintenance uh, manager, that would cut us back to more like a, a, a twenty to twenty-five thousand dollar per year contract on mowing, uh, not mowing, maintaining, pulling weeds, doing all that, rather than a hundred thousand, which is, I mean, we're up literally seriously pre-COVID around a hundred thousand to get that done. It's probably higher now. So that's kind of where we are. And then to go back and do the replantings in those areas that are green that we talked about, you know, if we were to sign off on something like this, it'd probably be a, anywhere from. Twenty to thirty thousand dollars in remove and replant with some species to get those areas back to it like we want. 
So that's kind of what we're bringing forward to you today is keep in mind all the public landscapes we have, why and why not a prairie versus a pollinator philosophy needs to be used here. I mean, I think we're more like a pollinator area than we are a prairie because it's just not big enough an area. It's, it's a lot of tiny areas and all zoomed out. It looks like one big area, but when you're there doing the maintenance, it's a bunch of tiny little islands and strips and things that are trying to grow 27 species of stuff and keep out the other 30 species that want to be in there. And it's, it's, it's either, it's either get a lot more money for maintenance and keep it up, or it's we try and figure out a way to strike a balance. And, and we know that some people will flip out if we cut down one sunflower, but that's there's currently people flipping out because there are sunflowers and everything. So that, that's kind of where we stand, and that we've got to find a balance. Can you go back to that that uh, little piece by the door? Yes, that one. Because here's the front door right here. And we were all standing right there. There's the book drop off or the book uh, uh, carousel right there. Okay. So in those areas, you um, talked about the plants remaining. Yeah, remaining. But we had also discussed pull, not as many, not the 27, but uh, maybe pulling back to what actually is on the sign, which was yes. 10 or 11. There's 11 on the sign. Things. And right here's where that one sign you can't even see because the, the, the stuff that's there unintentionally is a little too tall for that sign. I just wanted to mention that so um, you didn't think it was going to yeah. remain just as it looks today. Because even the library staff admits that it's a little, you know, they, they worry about kids. They have slow down and stop signs sitting right here in the drive because they're worried about kids that are small running out across here. They think it's even a site hazard for people exiting the library, going to their cars. They worry about this area right here to the point where they put a little, a little temporary or a you know, wet floor kind of stop sign, caution, go Little slow. Sign. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of where we are in all that, and we're just kind of going to throw it open for questions at this point. I don't know. I think Councilmember Holman had his hand up first. Yes. Um, so I think part of the intent of the landscaping was the stormwater management. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, I recall part of what we desired was lower maintenance or more natural stuff so that it wouldn't take as much landscaping maintenance right. to maintain. Um, so I'm kind of surprised to hear it's uh, the opposite of what yeah. uh, that is. So um, Low maintenance with little to no mowing. <laughs> yeah, that was the intent here is to save money. <laughs> no mowing. So I guess one question would be by removing a lot of that, are we impacting the negatively the stormwater uh, management part of the reasoning for this uh, being not just visually but to manage stormwater on the whole property too. Not being a stormwater engineer I don't know the absolute answer but we talked to Kerry Evenson we talked to people about I mean we still have the particularly in these areas where the, out in front you have that's the storm that's where the sign for the stormwater management they're talking about these drainage um, sheds right here that go to that and you know the, the plants the root system help filter the water before it gets to yeah, that yeah. that area and that's where we talked about there and here in the parking islands where you have these you know rock areas we talked about doing some insert some uh, pocket plantings of things that we can control a little better get some grasses and things that instead of just being 100 percent wild you know stem to stern to cut it back a little bit and i think we will still achieve those goals i mean i can't measure or know yeah. what percentage we're, we're not doing but it's still going to have the same method and the same you know we're not really changing the method we're just changing the uh the abundance of particularly volunteer species because like i said the thing is not accounted for in the low maintenance is the amount of weed pulling and tree pulling you have to fight elms are the worst i mean you can get hundreds of elms trying to grow in just one pollinated one pollination season you get elm seeds and cottonwoods and, and pears and all sorts of things that come Fully in grown elm tree is pretty cool though why would we not want those? <laughs> well we don't want to tell it's 700 other friends that are trying to grow right next to us so we have to pull them when they're young now we like the elms it would be right. great okay so yeah we just want to make sure that the stormwater impact is not or that we're not reducing or we could vet some of that maybe with impacting it to a certain extent anyway right um, since that was <coughs> part of the main motivating factor for this landscape was stormwater management and then uh, ideally having less maintenance we I guess we thought but, yeah that's a great point we would we would vet that through stormwater make sure that you know we're still keeping the intent there just the volume of plants will be reduced but I think the intent will still be filed from what I've been told in a sort of cursory way and I think it would be good to do edging on the sidewalks 
that would probably go a long way right there. Yeah. The sidewalks were just maintained with the edging part. I think it's probably a good idea to mow back from the sidewalk a little bit or from the parking, like as you mentioned. And I would want to leave some of the sunflowers. I think those are really cool. So I get and, it. Some people think they aren't, but. And I think we could do that. Like, like she said, at the entry, there's some that are growing. I think I had a picture of it back there's here. It's about seven foot tall. Yeah, back in these areas back yeah, here. If we yeah. choose to leave that, I show that as a replacement. We could leave that more as a wild area. And that's where you can explain some of those things to the callers more reasonably. It's not, it's not 200 sunflowers growing in a, in a, in a 50 square foot area. It's, it's six, you know, but that's where we'd still have, you know, $20,000 worth of maintenance a year, $25,000, because it would still take some work out there to, to hand pull and to be able to identify the things that we don't want there and do that properly because it's just, okay, it can't so be left by itself. The yellow would be mostly Remain. what's there right yes. now, but it would be pared down a bit. Yeah, the yellow and the gold. I mean, there's, these are all the sandwiches. This area right here, if you look at it, is all that lower grass, like the buffalo grass. Yeah. That's that look. So that's that's the gold so the area. To the left there. Yeah, that would be cut back for that sight line, and then this would be left as is pretty much. But that's where we'd spend our money on maintenance yeah. to have them go through those areas that are left wild and pull out. Well, if we I'm, reduce that I'm okay area. with cutting it back. I, I do want to maintain some of it. I mean, mm -hmm. there's people that like it, people that don't. I think it's, a, you know, compromise. You can cut some of it back, edge back. the sidewalks, pare some of it down. Um, so I, I'd be okay with that. Um, and then getting some more information about the stormwater part of it. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, and then... As a part of that, I mean, I've been thinking about this for a while. I've been like, if people are upset that they can't do this at their house, can we, I mean, I'd be interested in making it so they can. If it's this type of landscaping, you can show, you well, I'm doing this, then you, can. you can't just let it grow, you know, You can by wild, code, but, but you have to weed it. Okay. You can't have weeds in it. Because, yeah, so I was going to say, I mean, if we are doing it at the library, it makes sense to me that we would let people do that. I mean, I would get it if we were like, no, we're only doing it in our city property and you can't do it at your house. I could understand why people would yeah, be upset absolutely. and I would want to change that. But, uh, but yeah, if, uh, if people are allowed to, as long as they weed it, then uh, yeah, okay. So that's kind of my thoughts on that. Um, Excellent. Seems like a good compromise, I guess. Quick question. Are those parking uh, islands, medians, are those irrigated? Uh, are the ones where the stormwater is? I don't uh, know. Right, where those little concrete... Uh, I don't know if these are, right here, where we just have it all growing and the water flows to those. Wade, Wade knows where no, all, the, all the irrigated. Are irrigated. Yeah, these are out here. Okay. The long runs of the of the rock are not, but the end, cap, yeah, the end pieces are. Okay. And I think that's true up here, too. These are not irrigated in these long runs, but the, the ones we're going to leave are. Okay. Council Member Sedley. Um, I just wanted to... Clarify, can you say that again? We're currently spending a hundred thousand dollars. No, the so that was an estimated cost of what it would be if we hired a contracting company to come in there to weed it and keep it as it was originally intended by the landscape architect. That was an estimated contract price. We have not spent that money. But that was that was pre pandemic also. Sorry, so, I probably said we did spend it. I was just I was saying like, that was the what? price. So okay. that, and that was also pre pandemic. So we, we found out everything from um, pre March of two thousand twenty is probably about thirty to forty percent more expensive this is an old, this rate. This is an old issue, so we did get a price for that because one of the first things that what would it cost to have someone come in here and just stay after it and keep it weeding, keep the other thirty species from growing in here, Johnson grass, all that, and that was the price we got was about we didn't spend it, yeah. So you're saying with these changes, it would reduce that cost to 25000 a year? Roughly, Wade, is that about what we were thinking? Yeah, that would be the high end. That's also with uh, partners that's doing some of the work as well. And is there a view that we can look at that's everything together? or is it Yeah, no, I don't have that one because I was kept on working on these segmented ones. There is a view of everything, but uh, I don't think... I don't think I have that in this. Could I mean, you say that's, that to us? Yeah, that's sort of the, it, it, two, two views, that's sort of the front end, the southern end, and that is sort of the northern end. So okay. there's a little bit in between, like by the front door, but those two kind of show it all, okay. all the way up to the, the, the tip. Yeah, yeah I, I'm in agreement with um, Councilman Hol Council Member Holman about as long as it's doing what it still needs to do as far as stormwater, and it looks like we're still having pollinators and things like that, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, 
and I, I think it is a good compromise for folks that don't want to see that that close to the street and it's kind of blocking some views and a little bit of caution issues, right? So right. I, I think that what you have here is a really good plan. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Hall. Uh, so I've had the opportunity to visit twice in the last couple of weeks. Um, I really like hanging out with the Parks Department <laughs> every day if possible. The Party Department. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and of course this is in the heart of Ward 4 um, and so I, I really do have I think a better understanding at this point um, of trying to reach um, I mean this is a perfect example of really trying to reach a happy medium of addressing um, concerns with the community and we also you know you have acknowledged that you know as, as a Ward 4 council member I also hear the opposite end of you know there are a lot of people that aren't going to call and complain because they do like it and so right. um, I think that you all have been uh, thoughtful about how to achieve um, what the original vision and intent was um, and also you know addressing some of the concerns and so the 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 place that you pointed out that's right at the library entrance, if you could go back to that photo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right there. Um, so that, to my understanding, has this 26 different varieties of uh, plants right there in that very small area. That's intended varieties. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot yeah, more Yeah, and there's there a lot. Right of, uh, yeah, I understand. So we have a lot of other extras in there now, too. But what you really don't see, and I think you touched on it, is... Um, there's a there's a walkway in between there right and, right here um, <laughs> the um, library staff who also were a part of this conversation pointed out that you know it's a safety issue too at this point with small kids that right I mean little kids that are shorter than uh, what's planted there to even make a safe entry and exit into the library so we're not um, misrepresenting that, are we? I mean, that's true. No, okay, that's true. she's. Yeah. So um, anyway, so that so that's an issue right there, and um, along with Councilmember Holman, we did touch a little bit on the stormwater retention basin element of all of this, and my understanding was that even the medians in the parking lot is designed to be drainage, mm -hmm. you know, stormwater drainage areas. So that's already designed into it and so at this point it's just making sure that we can continue to have it function in that way which mm -hmm. you all said you would look into so I really like um, you know making sure that we do that and we even talked about um, you know those signs were added this summer in an effort to help educate the public on what we're trying to accomplish um, with the kind of plantings that we have there and the stormwater piece of it can also you know, be added as um, part of the part of the education effort to help people understand, you know, what what was originally intended. So, um, and they had that sign. We just ought to repeat it up there by the door. This one's yeah. out by, on Acre Street. Yeah, so that sign could be repeated and put it by the door as well, or out yeah. by the parking lot maybe. And so, I think you also pointed out that the actual signage for the entrance to the library, you really can't even see that at this point right um, and I don't know if you have a picture of that well I do it's just in the distance it's right back here yeah that sign that says yeah. book no, drop off this the way the this. entrance one James oh I'm sorry acres I think it's been cut back a little yeah, the, bit yeah the entrance one before. that one we did right there well, it's pretty bad we maintain we went through there we cut that one back yeah, already that, I'm not talking about that you're one. Talking, talking about about the other one that's okay, um, on that um, yeah. Entry, yeah, that entrance yeah, right there's there, that, you can't see it. You can't see the sign there, and then that one there is your sort of directional sign for when you're driving in, as to, and it's wow. almost covered. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I agree that um, looking for that sweet spot of reducing the maintenance cost, which no one anticipated at the time, um, and it being Oklahoma where the wind comes sweeping down the plane <laughs> every day. Full of seeds. Yeah. Um, but, but maintaining a lot of the original intent mm -hmm. and design. And it sounds like, you know, you really have worked towards um, that objective. There's a lot of yellow and gold on that map. So we're yeah. trying to keep as much as we can. We're just trying to and, find the problem areas. You know, there's going to be um, another discussion down the road when James Garner 
uh, gets extended. Mm. But for the time being, I really am also supportive of leaving the, the railroad side oh, yeah. more in its natural state. And, you know, you're going to have your hands full taking care of just the immediate things. But I would like to yeah. see that just main, just keep as is until we get to the... And this area right here is already gravel, I think. Wade pointed that out to me. This part is not planted. It's a little tiny, tiny, tiny strip. That one's already, that one was built back to gravel. But yeah. when you pick up the, it starts to widen. That's where you get the, mm -hmm. the planted area. And um, you know, we talked, we talked a little bit the other day about species, and I know you all are thinking about that and really trying to limit the mm -hmm. number. And to the sunflower point, I mean, there's lots of different species of sunflowers, mm -hmm. right? That maybe not have some. Or include some that aren't quite as tall and uh, visual obstruction, but still maintain that. And I really do think that, on the whole, um, there's a lot of interest and support in the community for moving towards the pollinator mm -hmm. garden. And um, we've achieved some of that, but we probably can do even a little better with a new plan to put a lot more emphasis on the pollinator mm -hmm. piece of it. So, agreed. And I got with Tim Vermillion. He's working a lot with the pollinator people. And there's certain species that we came up with between, you know, your ones that we've had success with also around town. Different black-eyed Susans, Coreopsis, mm -hmm. milkweed. I mean, we have to plant that, but it does well when you plant it. Uh, blanket flower, uh, salvia, Texas red sage, and then you also besides the pollinators want to have some habitat for others. So have blue stem, have love grass, have things like that. Even yuccas and. Uh, sumac like we have up on the bridge i mean there's different it doesn't have to all be pollinators because it's a right. habitat for everyone so i think we can we can do that pretty well butterfly bush is not a native species but it's a fantastic pollinator that does really well we have a plant around the old central library that's just mm -hmm. let go and it's gone yeah you know, it, it survives with little care and even when we go with the trees we go to replacing crepe myrtles do fantastic except when you have a, the world's record freeze then uh, <laughs> they all die back to the ground but you know those things and korean avodia you know a, the bee tree I mean, there's other species that we can so we're down to you know a pretty good selection of species and we can even mix in some boulders just to get sort of that you know out in the prairie kind of look uh, that we have on some of our public landscapes and then the final thing i just wanted to address which is something we've actually already discussed too is that the use of of the grasses that we're choosing to use and so my, one of my big concerns when we started this conversa conversation last week was that we're just going to plant a bunch of Bermuda grass and you just mow away. And yeah. the grasses that you have that are the lower grasses that do get mowed less often yes. than a regular buffalo, right? Buffalo grass. Yeah. Yeah. And that only has to be mowed once a month instead of twice a month. So, and it's a more natural, um, native type of look. And so I'm definitely supportive of keeping that type of grass there right. too. Right, yes. Thank you. Council Member Schuler. Um, thanks. You started talking about the trees, and that's kind of how I got brought into this conversation was a constituent talk alerted me to the um, the red buds uh -huh. at, uh, in the parking lot area, and Tim went out um, and did say that they were in distress because they're not a good parking lot tree. Right. Um, and so, you know, just as we think about... Um, maintaining and updating the trees in I guess this particular parking lot but then as we think about other projects I think as council it's really not, I'm you know appreciate what the balance that we're trying to strike here and kind of moving forward um, but as we think about future projects that come to council when we're thinking about doing more projects like this and I think mm -hmm. we've probably learned a ton of lessons um, about what to do and what not to do. Um, but when we're thinking about landscaping on, you know, future Norman forward projects or things when we're thinking about doing pollinator gardens versus prairie, mm -hmm. um, or whatever, how much, um, say do we have in what types of landscaping goes in there when we're using a developer or a landscaping firm? Um, just because we know now what doesn't work. Well for Norman Ford projects, we have a lot of say. For private developments, I mean, there's a landscape ordinance and it gets reviewed by the planning division and there's a list of certain, you know, trees not to plant and things like that. For the Norman Ford projects, they, the plans all vet through us. So when we get to the YFAC, there'll be a landscape plan. Um, same thing with the senior center. We are doing the same diligence on the, I'm getting ready to do the project to remodel uh, Reeves Park and there's, 
tree work in there and we're working with you know landscape architects on that and I myself am a landscape architect so we do a lot of control on that this one you know it was the direction of previous councils and other people that we wanted a prairie landscape so we did as much editing as we could the original plan was to plant this whole thing on a dirt patch from seed and try and grow it in and we convinced them with no irrigation so we convinced them that the seed mix needs to be irrigated from day one and they did and it took off um, we recommended they supplement the seed planting with some container grown stuff which they did and it's helped to this thing to proliferate and so we've had a, a lot of editing comments this one just happened to be that there was no turning back from doing a prairie landscape thinking of it they should have been thinking of it as a pollinator landscape and cut the species back there's things that could have been done differently but this was going to be kind of like this because that was the direction it went so this one we did learn that lesson i guess and the trees like i said the trees we had we had the that moment was, of clarity yeah, that was pre us having a, a forester in place so we didn't get the chance to run that through our forester Sorry. Yeah, I mean, mostly I'm just thinking about projects that we'll have to maintain as a city, right? Because then that costs us money if we have to then go yeah. in and plant trees or, you know, maintaining those things. So um, I'm a little less concerned with what yeah. other developers are doing if we're not yeah, having we'll to go maintain that. But um, like hopefully that we don't have a short memory on, <laughs> you know, what works and what doesn't. Um, I think this is, we've learned a lot of lessons in this project is, is what I... Right, right yeah, prior to Norman Ford, like I said, these bridge projects were public works projects. They tasked the Parks Department and me with coming up with a landscape, which we did, yeah. and this has been pretty successful. I mean, it survives and it thrives and in a very harsh environment. So we would go more toward, on our, on our projects, we're not going to try and plant a prairie, but we can certainly plant pollinators and plants that are tough and hardy and can survive neglect and abuse and all the kind of things that happen when you have public landscape for people to wander through and or do whatever they do so yeah, I can a, assure you that if I'm ever involved in another project <laughs> <laughs> that this we will not be doing it like that <laughs> <laughs> it's been a true experience to say the least and yeah. I, I would just like to add that uh, councilmember Carter former councilmember Carter has reached out to me a couple of times um, and he's working with Tim on some pollinator gardens down by I-35 mm -hmm. and he reached out to me again today um, and he you know he did have concern about the way this looks and was this concern kind of went back to it gives all of it kind of a bad name and and they're really trying to do some wonderful things with these pollinator gardens and if this is what people think that is going to look like that it kind of makes it all look bad so um, he was definitely supportive of trying to you know change it up here a little bit yeah I'm finished. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I just wanted to add that, you know, this is the home of the central library in the Pioneer Library System, and these are the folks that uh, know how to program <laughs> and educate. And, you know, I know that there's lots of opportunity um, for programming just at the library, too, of um, trying to um, use this as an opportunity for stormwater mitigation and drainage, and also just for. Um, you know, pollinator, native prairie habitat, those sorts of things. So lots of programming potential too that I know they're interested in. Well, I certainly appreciate the presentation. Uh, you know, for me, this all, much like everybody else has said, this comes down to two things. And it's one, it's addressing the safety of, you know, the pullouts and the, the islands and the medians. And it seems like you guys have done that as well. Um, and that it's also, you know, maintaining the spirit of what the original intent of the project was. And it seems like you guys have done that. So I think... I think it's a solid plan. Uh, I'm really happy to see it, much like Council Member Hall said. I'm really happy to see that you guys didn't come back and just put monoculture everywhere, just Bermuda grass everywhere. And I think we can do that if you want. Hang no, on. No, 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 no. no, no. Uh, I think I think you're uh, changing the narrative. Just from looking being, for direction. Being a prairie or pollinator, I think that's that's the yeah. right step. So it's, uh -huh. we, we do agree that if our landscape architect comes in and says, "Yeah, flat Bermuda," we probably have the wrong landscape I architect on right. staff. Just I guess. guess. I'm glad you're right. <laughs> Now, about the golf course, I want to change. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, guys. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. I'm just going to leave this. I don't, I don't know have? if there's another one. Yeah, there is. But... Okay. You going to pull it up, or do you know where it is? Huh? Get yeah, it on the desktop? Okay. Close that one. All right, on to our second item on our agenda, a uh, discussion regarding a proposed ordinance 02122-17 regarding community resource refrigerators. And I believe that staff has a presentation on this one as well. Oops. Wait, no, no, sorry. Okay. 
Yeah, so community resource refrigerators. Um, I'm sure all of you are at least on some level aware of this issue. Uh, but just to give you some background, just the relevant stuff, there's a lot of background that you can get into. Uh, maybe talk to Lee Hall if you have any questions about that. She has a very good <laughs> understanding of it. Uh, but So this is my understanding of it, and this is, I think, the relevant portion. So in early 2021, you have a group in the community who started uh, operating a community fridge, and that was on Main Street. Uh, that was kind of closer to Porter. And so they start. They were operating in early of 2021. It continued operating continuously at the beginning of 2021 until about June. And then in June, what you see is uh, we got some complaints. I think they were mostly regarding, uh, I think, maybe trash and debris. Uh, but anyway, so it comes in June 2021, it comes into code compliances. <coughs> They recognize they they're, they're made aware of the uh, community fridge, and so and what you see is uh, in our ordinance we do have a uh, nuisance violation that says you cannot leave any uh, any appliance unattended out in the public where it can be accessed. So uh, and it also we have another uh, 205 that says you can't have anything in the right of way that is obstructing the right of way. So based on those two ordinances, code compliance, um, and they were receiving complaints, uh, they notified the property owner that it was not in compliance with our code. So uh, in July of 2021, they relocate this fridge into a private building, uh, and it is still operational, but it is not outside, and it is not operational 24-7. Uh, so. Uh, it has been moved, and during this time there was also a second fridge. Uh, I don't know if it, this is not has been uh, not as much attention was on the second fridge, but that was at Redeemer Church that was over on Lindsay Street, uh, and that was being operated on private property. It was not in the right of way, but it was still unattended because it was left outside and it wasn't being attended at all hours. So uh, they, after learning about what happened on Main Street, they chose to relocate that inside as well. So uh, I think, but, or, or maybe they um, stopped operating it for other reasons as well. But I know at least one is still operating. It's just in, operating inside during business hours. <coughs> All right, so current barriers um, do exist for how these have been operating in early in 2021. So the main barrier uh, generally is uh, section 10-204. And that says that you can't have any unattended appliance and what that basically means is as they were operated, they would be unattended because they were not, they didn't have someone who was there 24 seven, like, you know, in Walgreens where they have fridges there, but you know, they're in their commercial fridges, but they're operated because there's someone there to um, go over it with them. And there's like someone from the business, but you have these fridges that are outside and at 3 a.m. no one's there from the you know business who can look over it. And then you have, um, so what you see is there, you can have a community refrigerator, you just can't operate it in the same way because it can't be left outside. So that's the big that's the big barrier there. So it's not an outright barrier, but it's enough that it's not allowing them to operate as they intended. So staff was assigned to do a code change that did two things. First, they wanted, uh, you know, staff was uh, asked to uh, draft an ordinance that allows operated community fridges that were unattended, basically that could be left outside, similar to the ones that had been operating prior to code compliance, um, letting them know that they were not in compliance. And so basically how that's gonna work is it ends up being an exception to 10-204, which is the unattended appliance section. And second, this came a little after during the discussion of how we were gonna do this, but staff was also asked to place safety regulations on operation of these community refrigerators because there were concerns about some of the safety aspects of operating a fridge outside. Oh, and by the way, uh, we wanna do this really quickly, and so staff had two weeks to do these changes, and so that's uh, uh, what we're looking at here. So just, you know, and, and I bring that up because if you do have questions and I can't necessarily answer all of them, it's because we have really fast-tracked this ordinance. So I haven't been able to really uncover every stone and, you know, look at all the crevices and determine, like, you know, so there's auxiliary issues that may not have been had time to address. So, but I promise I'll get back to you if there is something you guys want to know. All right, so uh, in drafting this ordinance, the first step is one, understand what is a community refrigerator. Uh, as I spoke to someone over at the health department, they were like, is that like a vending machine? And so they didn't really know what it was. Um, not a lot of people know what it was. Uh, so 
basically what we did in order to understand is we aggregated data from across the U.S. because there are a lot of different communities operating uh, these refrigerators, and so each one is a little different. They have their own little flavor and style, so aggregating them to at least understand on a general level what does a community refrigerator look like, how is it operated, what are the fundamental uh, characteristics that we can find. And second, like because everyone has its own local flavor, flavor, we talked to local stakeholders, and we, uh, me and Cynthia, had a discussion with them, and to we, because we really wanted to know how what does a Norman community refrigerator looks like compared to a Boston community refrigerator or a uh, you know LA community refrigerator. So that was really important too, because we want to if you know the objective is to maintain how they were operated before, then we have to understand that. So we're not creating something totally different that doesn't meet that need. And so, in here, and here's like just a few examples. The middle one is actual one from Norman. Uh, and then you have two on the other side. As you can see, they're just like standard household appliances that are placed usually outside. Uh, a lot of them, I mean, almost all of them, I don't think I've seen anyone that doesn't contain some sort of art that is applied to the face of the fridge. Um, and most of them, you know, they're pretty clear on the face of the fridge. This is free food, right? This is like donations. So. Uh, and and, and this, this has been around for a while, but I think it's really popped into, you know, it has come into popularity since COVID. And so this has really been a community-led initiative that responded to some of the food insecurity needs that arose out of the COVID pandemic. So that's what you're seeing, and you're seeing a lot of the more of them pop up, just like the one in Norman. And so you're getting a lot of these. It's more of a, a new issue, so we haven't seen a whole lot of regulation or any other guidance on these in terms of other municipalities. So uh, there's not a whole lot of reference material in terms of how communities are dealing with this on a government level. So, and here's a little bit of a close-up of Boston. If you know, Boston has like a lot more than another, a lot of other cities. And so I think Oklahoma City may have three, um, Denver may have two or three, but Boston seems to have a lot of them. And I think a lot of attention has uh, been brought to Boston because they do have a little bit more formal uh, you know, governmental regulation or guidance concerning community fridges. And so basically what we learned uh, in this first step from both the stakeholder interviews and aggregating this data is from some really basic characteristics of what makes a community fridge a community fridge. First, it, is, it has a goal of addressing local food insecurity, right? So that's the main goal. It's food donations that are meant to be free. So, so it, that's a big part of it, right? This is not a commercial endeavor. Um, a lot of community fridges, uh, if someone wants to sponsor them, they kind of, you know, put a little bit of a, a spin on that and says, well, you cannot use it to, like, I guess, enhance your own business. This is supposed to be something that is not commercial. And so that's really important uh, to a lot of the people who are maintaining these community fridges. Most are outdoors. And I think that's part of the 24-7 aspect. Anyone can, you know, come up and grab food that they need if they need it, and uh, they can do it at any time. And, you know, it's monitored and stocked by community volunteers. So this is not usually something that a private business is taking on on their own. This is something, and I, this is also at the end, it's, it, it, it's something that's grounded in the idea of mutual aid, which is solidarity, not charity. So it's not, you know, like feed the children or, you know, feed America. It's, you know, group of community members who are dedicated to helping solve local food insecurity by taking matters into their own hands and donating food for anyone in the community who needs it. So what you see is it's really meant to be low barrier, meaning that no one has to sign up in order to take food or give food. And, um, you know, there are no, you know, qualifications. So anyone can take food. So, and that's kind of the, you know, that's what makes it different and that's what makes it more community driven. And I think that's kind of what makes it unique. So in order to attain all of that, we really need to you know, be cognizant of that every time we draft an ordinance um, so that we don't lose that, uh, as I've been saying, flavor. No pun intended, relating to food. Okay, so, again, this is the assignment, right? Yeah. We'll, so how do we allow operation of unattended community refrigerators, similar to ones that have been operating, and also place safety regulations on operation of the community refrigerators? But there's tension between those two, right? Because the more regulation you place on these, the less you're gonna be able to operate them, right? If you operated them like a restaurant and had the same sort of requirements, they would not be able to exist. So that, this is a recognition that while we want to do two, 
we have to strike a very fine balance uh, in order to achieve both. And so I think that is really, um, that was a difficult balance to strike, especially in two weeks, but I think this is a really good uh, way forward with that. But at the same time, you know, taking one away is going to, you know, if you put more emphasis on one, you're going to have less emphasis on number two, and the vice versa is also true. So that's really a policy decision that you guys are going to have to think about whenever you're thinking about how to strike that balance and where you guys want that balance to end up at. All right, so taking that tension in mind, I reframed the assignment. So how can we draft an ordinance that imposes safety regulations on community refrigerators in a way that still allows them to operate similar to they have been operating? So with that in mind, I wanted to understand step two, which is the regulatory context. I mean, my main concern here was like, can we actually operate them? Because that's a big one. Can we allow this or is it going to be impacted by other state or local re uh, regulations that are going to make it, um, you know, we go through all this trouble, we make them, and then they get shut down by the state, for example. Is that going to happen? So no, it's not, thankfully. Uh, but so how, and, and we looked at how other municipalities treat this. No, currently no municipality has any, uh, adopted any formal regulation or ordinances that address this specific issue. Obviously, they're going to have regulations already in place that impact how they operate, but I haven't really found anyone who's really addressed this other than Boston. But they didn't do any formal regulation. They did an informal guideline. And that guideline came out of actually an office called the uh, Office of Food Access in uh, Boston. So it was more of a guideline to help people get started, I think. Um, to kind of encourage uh, community refrigerators, but it also did have some basic safety guidelines. But again, those were guidelines. Those were not binding against those uh, community refrigerator operators. In Oklahoma, so I was wanted to make sure that, like example, the state couldn't shut them down if we were wanting to allow this. Um, and technically, if you look at the regulations that the state has adopted over food uh, service establishments, they would be covered. But you have the regulations, but also the state statutes that gives the um, agency the power to adopt those regulations. So what you see is the state requires that it has to be for sale. So it's commercial, right? But the regulations themselves do not reflect that. And so I really needed to make sure that, you know, which one are we looking at here? Are we, would they be covered or wouldn't they? And so I was able to actually get on the contact with, or get in contact with their general counsel um, and he did say that they wouldn't be covered by state statute. But at the same time, I was kind of confused because if you go to like uh, safe food donation uh, services on the state website, it links you to those regulations. So um, I'm not quite, you know, there's a little bit of a disconnect there, but I think we're covered. Uh, so uh, there's not going to be a state health regulation. And, no, and I would also note that they are not currently regulated in any instance. So there is no state regulation if they were to operate inside, for example, and it was unattended, if it was attended. So that's important to keep in mind as well. So if they operate outside versus inside, are they going to be treated differently in terms of the city? So that's something to keep in mind. And then other barriers still may exist. So I wasn't able to uh, uh, overturn or turn over every stone. So part of that is also fire code, building code, making sure everything is you know still in compliance and that on a fundamental level they can operate without like violating some golden uh, rule that would make it non uh, wouldn't allow it to operate. So far I couldn't find anything other than section 10-204. All right, so finally we can get to the drafting, the fun part. Um, so basically how this is going to work is it's going to create an exception in 10-204, which is the unattended appliance section. So this is the only uh, or the main section that this is going to address. So if you know, if you noticed um, back when we were talking about the street, uh, the fridge on Main Street, that had two different violations. That was first 204 and 205. 205 dealt with the right of way. This ordinance does not deal with that issue because that cannot be really addressed on a global scale. That is more of a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if you guys do want to address that, that is how, I mean, it would just have to go through a different process, not necessarily an ordinance change. So, but, so it's an, turning back to 204, that we can address with an ordinance change. <coughs> so, 
how we did that was we created an exception under that, and we added a new article to Chapter 13, Licenses and Occupations, that would allow these uh, community refrigerators to be licensed and to operate. So, in the uh, licensing scheme, we did uh, put some minimum safety guidelines and regulations, and these are generally consistent with prior operations. Uh, and that was something else, you know, in terms of, you know, talking to these community stakeholders, I mean, this is a <coughs> volunteer donation effort, right? So you're not going to have a whole lot of problems with a food bank having, you know, really poor quality food because they're not doing it for the money. They're doing it because they care about the people who they're serving and they're going to make sure that, you know, you're not going to give some rancid food or half-eaten food to people who you're trying to help. So I think that's also important to understand where it's coming from in terms of motivation. So 10-204, this is what would have normally prohibited community refrigerators, but it adds subsection C. So it basically says that this section does not apply if they are licensed under Article 36 of Chapter 13. So it's a pretty standard exception. And then you actually get into the Chapter 13 permitting. So you, first you have to define it, and this is the definition we came up with, a refrigerator that is located on private property that is openly accessible to the public and which serves as a point of direct distribution of food items to consumers without requiring anything of monetary value. So you have donations, but you also have uh, openly accessible. Uh, and also there is a pub, uh, the private property uh, caveat there, and that is to make sure that if it, when you have uh, the operation of uh, you know, something like this, where it's on property, right, you might be concerned about, uh, you know, some sort of liability. And I know there's a lot of, you know, different talk about, you know, well, it's donated food, so th there's no liability associated. Well, that's not necessarily true. So in order to keep the city from incurring any risk of liability from premises liability, uh, we were chose to keep this on private property. And then that way the private property owner can uh, go through any of the applicable uh, you know, exemptions from premises liability or food donation liability, and they can make that choice for themselves. I do. I think that if we did open it up to public property, the city would be um, facing risk of liability if someone were to get sick. So that's that's the reason why we included it on a private property because I don't think those general exceptions to food donations would apply to the city. So. What would they have to do in order to get licensed? Obviously, the big thing is there's no fee to apply. This is a you know a donation, a community good, so we're not going to require them to do a $25 license fee or anything like that. But there are going to be some application qui uh, requirements. I mean, first, we need to know who is applying for a permit, where the property is located. Um, if it's like a, a property owner slash lessee, where they're leasing the property, we want to know both the lessee and the property owner. And we're also going to want a site plan with the fridge location marked on it. Now, that sounds scary, but really all you need to do is go to free like the free GIS service. You can have an interactive map on the city's website. You can just take a screenshot or print it from the website and then just mark with an X where you want the fridge to go. So that has the boundaries of the uh, building and like also the lot lines. And that allows the city, when we're reviewing the application, to make sure that this isn't on a right of way or it doesn't, it's not in an easement or it's not going to block ingress or egress into the building. So, and it's not super scary and it's not going to be something that's that uh, difficult to do if you're an applicant. And then also, we wanted a signed acknowledgement from the property owner. So if, like, for example, a lessee of a building wants to operate a community fridge, we just want to make sure that the property owner knows about it and is okay with that property use. And that way they don't encounter any other trouble down the line because the property owner says it's a violation of their lease or, you know, an insurance company finds out about it and then there's a big to-do and then they're not allowed to uh, do it down the road. And then also we just want a reference copy of their donation guidelines that they're going to post on the face of the refrigerator. So this is just to ensure that they have gone that extra step to make sure that and they've thought through like what they're going to do to make sure that the food that is getting donated and that it is in the fridge is going to be safe. There's no specific requirements on what kind of food can be donated, what can't be donated. We're just leaving it up to them to determine what can be donated and what can't. And finally, there's the location requirements. <coughs> One, it has to be on private property. We've already went over that. But also, it should be on non-residential property. So the reason for that is if this were operating in a neighborhood and it had 24-hour access, we were a little concerned about other property owners 
next to it, and this would be a residential area, most likely, and those are gonna have a lot more complaints associated with it, right? So in business areas where you're expected to have members of the public come in and you know do service, it just fit more consistently with those sorts of uses to have them there. And that way, you also don't have a rash of complaints that are uh, arising from you know, residents about their neighbor who is operating a community fridge and it's open 24 seven. And so and that's something else that we included. And then finally have the safety requirements. First, you must put post donation guidelines to promote safe donation practices. And that's just to ensure, again, that they're doing their due diligence to make sure that whatever it gets donated, people know what's okay, what's not okay. Like most of it's like no raw meat. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of cities have been shifting towards no homemade items, but uh, you know, there is some need for that. I think in at least the people who were operating the fridge before, they would really like that because they do see a lot of that coming in to the Norman fridge. And they're also seeing a lot of uh, those items get taken out of the fridge really quickly. So we're also requiring daily temperature checks. That's just to make sure that the refrigerator is operating and able to reach temperatures that are necessary for food safety. Um, and I think out in the Oklahoma heat, if you're checking it daily and you're seeing that, you know, over time, the temperature is rising and rising, it's time for a new fridge. So it's just to make sure that they're um, keeping on top of the quality of the fridge. And finally, if it's outdoors, it also needs an appropriate outlet and an in-use receptacle cover. Um, so basically the appropriate outlet, what that means is these are fire code issues. So if you're going to have something that is open to the elements, you need to have make sure that it's in a, uh, a socket that is designed, it's I think NFIC, or basically the, the outlet in your bathroom that has the little buttons that you press in case, you know, you drop your hair dryer in the bathtub or something. So that's just kind of something that the fire code would require, but also the in-use receptacle cover serves a dual purpose. Um, again, protects the outlet from the elements, and two, it protects it from someone unplugging the machine. So, because uh, you, you can lock those. So that's also important. And then there are, in every case, other code requirements that may apply, but that depends on the situation. Like there may be a specific fire code violation that only one location would have because of some weird uh, fire code provision that applies to certain outlets or something. So that's just gonna have to be on a case by case basis and they're gonna have to, you know, we would recommend they check with the fire marshal and they will go out there and they will check with them and they will propose alternatives and make sure that they're compliant. So, and that, you know, so that's simple enough and it also makes sure that everything's safe. Um, Anthony, just a, a, a quick thought that as the former central library is remodeled and becomes the one-stop shop, the ability to check that, you know, submit the application and make sure the fire code is, it'll all happen at one counter. It'll be super duper convenient going forward. Yes, that's a good point. All right, and then posting requirements will want, I mean, this is basically pretty simple and this is already happening. If with basically all community fridges that I could find, you just have language saying it's a community fridge. You have your donation guidelines, contact information in case something is, you know, gone bad in the fridge or, you know, if there's anything wrong with it and someone needs to come out that you can contact, and then also contact information from city code compliance in case we need to address an issue. And luckily we have an application so we can call and make sure that they know about the issue and see if they can come and address it. So, all right. So that's about it. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. I got I just a couple really quick. Um, on the donation guidelines, uh, I know you said you wanted to leave the flexibility up to the entity basically providing, but. Is there any boilerplate language, standard language that we could get from maybe the county web health department website that would yeah. act as a like a base set so that we know we know everybody's kind of operating from the same ground rules? So, I mean, that's a good question because I was also that's a, the approach I was originally thinking I was going to take. Right, as I was going to take some stuff from the you know county health department and see what they had and kind of apply it here. Well, I found out that it's 150 page food safety regulation saying <laughs> if I'm going to pick and choose what we want, then it's going to, you know, that's a long, long process and that's not going to be able to happen in two weeks. Right. But also you have the staff side, right? I mean, do we want code compliance to go out and make sure that the milk isn't expired? You know, that's going to be something that we're going to have to think about. If we put those requirements in there, sure. that's going to become a code complaint issue and they're going to have to go out there and they're going to have to check. And that's not necessarily something that we would expect code compliance to do. Mm -hmm. So that, I think those are the two main reasons uh, that we, I just didn't see that as feasible. And, and you see 
every single community fridge that I had had very consistent guidelines with one another, and they all had guidelines on what you could do and what you couldn't. Um, so I didn't see it was really that much of an issue. But I think that it's also something to note that you're not going to be able to get the same kind of food safety level that you're going to get in a restaurant. Sure. This is outside, but it's also donation, right? And there's a reason, I mean, keep in mind, before we even had this discussion, they wouldn't have been regulated by the state either way. So they currently can operate out of Norman or in Norman in a different, you know, in a building attended without any regulation. And they have been, and we haven't had any food safety complaints that we know of. So I think, you know, leaving it up to the individual entity, I think will be fine. I don't think that's gonna necessarily cause any issue because again, this is coming from a good place and you know, it's been consistent with all the community fridges that I found. Sure, sure. No, I appreciate that clarification. That actually dovetails really nicely into my second question is those daily temperature checks, is that being reported anywhere? Or are we just basically saying honor system? Uh, if you, okay. Pretty much. Okay. So, I mean, I think that's just a requirement that they understand. And if we go out there and someone says, this thing ain't even running. And we're like, okay, well, have you been doing your daily temperature checks? Then we kind of know. And if it's another issue when we come out again, then we know that it's time to take action. Gotcha. So, yeah. And is there any recourse for pulling that permit at a certain point if they buy I mean, if they, it seems to be a safety risk or um, deemed just an unsafe situation, is there any way to revoke that permit? Yeah. So, I mean, I, and maybe not necessarily that revoke the permit, but I mean, I think there is some things too. If like they're not operating within the requirements, then they might not meet that exception. So now they fall under 205, uh, 204. Okay. And so at that point, code compliance can go out there and say, you are not in compliance. Gotcha. And they have a certain amount of time to get it in compliance. And I think that's another po important point too, is, you know, if, you know, something happens where it's not safe, right, they can have time to make it safe, right? So if someone goes out there and then they just like trash it, right? They're not going to be shut down because that one person you know, wasn't doing the right thing and they trashed it, they can go out there and they can take care of it. And so, which they have done pretty consistently from my understanding whenever they hear about complaints. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, Council Member Sudley. Okay, um, you had mentioned premises liability. Can you explain that a little bit more? Okay, so yes. So basically, whenever you invite someone onto like a premise, let's say it's a park, right? You have certain duties to make sure that any condition that's there that you're inviting these people to is safe. And so if you are not able to make that safe or if there are some sort of conditions that you know about that could be unsafe and you don't take steps to remedy that, then you could be liable under a negligent standard. And then the um, city could face a tort claim action. And uh, so basically it could end up in the city having liability if someone does get sick. So. What you see is a lot of these, uh, a lot of community members have stated that there are a lot of, there are state and federal uh, statutes that do say, uh, that, that do provide like exemptions from liability for people who donate food. But keep in mind that's for people who are donating food, not people who are supplying donated food. So that is something to consider. So if the city were to donate food, we might, you know, enjoy that li uh, uh, liability exception. But if we're the ones providing it, we might not. And so that's the problem. Hmm. So currently, and I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. So currently yeah. on Main Street, we have this special use permit for restaurants that uh -huh. would like to have a table outside. And they pay this extra fee. They can have their table sitting out there. So are you saying that falling under premises liability, since you as the city or we as the city are allowing those tables to be out there through a permit, let's say I'm eating dinner with Lee, we get up, I have a drink left there and a child walks by and grabs my drink and drinks it. Would the city then be liable um, under permise, premises liability? So that's a, that's a really good question. And so we have to keep in mind that private property is gonna be a little bit different than right away. Right, there a lot, and they have. There's overlap there, right? And it depends. It's very context specific, but what you see is like you know easements, right of way, and then actual publicly owned property. They're going to be treated a little differently. So I can't, and that's part of the. I'm, I'm talking specifically on Main Street, in front of a business on Main Street. Would we have liability if like yes. you know, something like that? Yes. 
I do not have the answer to that question. Like I said, I haven't really been able to really tackle that right of way issue because it's not necessarily central to this ordinance, but. Well, it I, kind of is because yes, no. part of the second mm -hmm. piece is it sticks out a little bit further into the right of way. So the reason that I'm asking this line of questioning is if we can create this special permit for restaurants to have tables out there mm -hmm. on their sidewalks, could we not also create a similar permit because the language on that permit is really easy to read it's easy to follow five feet from the, the the road you know five feet in you can't be blocking the sidewalk so could we not create something similar to that so that we could put it back in some place like in front of resonator where it's still five feet from the road there's plenty of, of space but that business or the leasee may would like uh to to pay extra money to have that refrigerator on Main Street. Okay. And that is a question that we have um, considered, but and it's a little bit different, I think, from where we started, but I would like to address it any, uh, because I think what the question you're asking, if I'm understanding, is can we make it to where uh, a refrigerator, like table and chairs, can operate in the right of way? Right? Correct. Yes. So we may. That is my that is the answer I can give you now. So, but it would need to be done separately. So think of it this way: right. if you are like um, a business owner and you want to operate a restaurant on Main Street, you have to get licensed under Chapter 13 for uh, your food handlers and like food service establishment license. But you also have to get a permit to operate in the right of way. Right. So it's going to be two separate avenues for you to operate like you want. So, and I think that's what we're going to talk. That's kind of how we're approaching this. Right, you're going to have your permit to operate your community fridge, right. and the next step after we get this is I'm going to see how do we, you know, what is the context around operating it on a right of way, right? And is that something that we can accommodate? Because I mean, you have a commercial appliance in a right of way versus a table and chair, so it might be treated differently. We might not be able to, or we might have to go through about it a different way. So I, and, and that's going to touch on a lot of different things something that I probably couldn't have done in two weeks. So this part was the easy part, and I think that's the next part that's gonna be a little bit more difficult and it's gonna take a little bit more time. But luckily this is an ordinance and it's gonna take a little bit to reach so the final step. Just so, we so that we're that all on the same page then, what we're talking about tonight is getting the ordinance changed to allow the refrigerators back in our community in a public, or a, excuse me, a private operation at this point, but the conversation is not done, even if we pass this in a council meeting to pass this ordinance, there are still certain exceptions that we can make regarding this whole thing. Is that what you're saying? Like we can look at other, like these permits or? Yes, so we can explore those options going forward. So I think, and here's a good way to think about it. Redeemer Church had a fridge and they're probably gonna be able to operate just with this, right? But someone else wanting to operate it in a right of way, we're not there yet. So, but if they wanted to operate it in some way that didn't impact the public right of way, they could still do so, right, um, under this ordinance. But like, like, like you said, there's still some work that needs to be done and we need a little bit more time on. So, but that is something that we plan on addressing. Okay, yeah. fair enough. I think the distinction between the example you brought up and this is that in the restaurant setting, that's also regulated by ABLE. The alcohol, I uh, forget the acronym, but well, my basically, whole point so, of that was the premises liability. Well, where I was going with that is that from the front door to the tables, they have to have a barrier roped off area. So it's not. No, they don't. Uh, in terms of the streeteries and the able commission, that is that's the requirement as it far as I understand. It's considered part of the licensed premises, right. which is a little bit different from premises liability. But this, the right of way permits, the sidewalk cafe permits we do, are, like Anthony said, are totally separate process and things we're looking for in those are indemnity clauses to exempt us to protect us from liability insurance things like that and so we build in protections through that process meaning that the the business that's applying for these permits is saying that they will be responsible right okay yeah. <laughs> i'm trying to i try to put the sidewalk cafe I can tell you for certain. I have said at Winston, it was not inside a barrier. It was a little table, and I could have a drink, and there was no barrier that stopped anyone once I got up from grabbing up. I don't so. want to say they're in violation, but. Um. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's supposed to be marked off. The way I understand it, it's supposed to be a delineated yeah. barrier, as the language says. Um, 
Guys, got a hold in. Yeah, that was similar. My line of questioning was the right of way thing. So I, I'm glad that we'll yeah. spend some more time and revisit that because we do actively encourage tables and chairs on the sidewalk, and many of them can take up as much or more space on the sidewalk than a refrigerator would. So, uh, so I was wondering about why that would have been in violation and not the picnic table in front of the garage or something. Um, I think with like Neighborhood Jam and the Winston, you know, when they rebuilt that building, they built it back further from the from where the old building was so they could have that patio. So that would be private property. Okay. The patio at the Neighborhood Jam and the Winston. And I'm not sure. Because it's their sidewalk and then they, yeah. there's a patio that is, I think, their private property. Correct. They're so they right. could put a, they could, they could put a refrigerator on that patio if they wanted Maybe. to. Maybe. I don't know. If it's private property. Yeah. If, if it, it gets kind of funky in downtown, yeah. but I think when they moved that building back, yeah. that you're right, they did. So they would be, they'd be okay with this Just ordinance this. change uh, to do that. And so if Resonator, if they were able to say, take one of those window panes out of the front and install the refrigerator into it so that it doesn't stick out into the right of way then they would be fine under this maybe potentially yeah mm -hmm. so yeah. i don't know that could be one way to get around that but That's a good but that was my real question was how yeah tables and chairs and how that would be different i understand appliance and being plugged in and is definitely a difference so uh but that was my kind of main question as well that Studly I maybe think something. Just to clarify, this is all appliances. This would be dishwashers, washing machines, everything, right? I think technically, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's not just limited exclusively to refrigerators. And, and I think a lot of that, like originally the ordinance um, was drafted in a way because like, you know, when back when fridges had latches and kids died in them because they couldn't get out from the inside, mm -hmm. but it's kind of evolved over time. So it's, now it's more than that. It's not just latches. It's any refrigerator, but that's also because there's like if, if you have like refrigeration or something like that, then it could be like a hazardous material and you don't want that to be left somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and it also kind of helps people like, and then if you want it like picked up at the side of the curb, like you have to go through a little bit more of a process. So it now it has evolved into more than just the little children getting stuck in the car. So. Kind of building on that though, in a previous discussion, we talked about some requiring it to be bolted down and in some of the pictures you saw, it was bolted down to something mm -hmm. because now fridges, you can, they're not latched. You can push out of them unless it falls over and then you're in the exact same scenario. So I think that's an important safety requirement. Let me see. Well, I don't know if you saw those, but they're on pallets. Like Yeah, the pallets are bolted little... into the pallet. Right? Ah, okay. I see now. So like this one right here. Yeah. Yeah, that one on the right is bolted Which, into the pallet yeah, and then bolted pallet. into the ground the yeah. the and then that one's bolted onto a pallet yeah so I, I, don't, I don't even know if that one's bolted but that one is and so <laughs> i think if we create a toolkit and how to do this yeah. we should provide and here's how you do that not just like well how the hell am i supposed to yeah <laughs> you know we can show them examples from other communities but i do think that's a another safety issue but if it or even if it's like how that top holds it so yeah. it may not be from the bottom oh yeah you could anchor it to, to the wall yeah. from the roof yes. yeah absolutely yes. Yes. something to keep it from i mean even if imagine if it's not someone's inside it still falls on them it could be bad yeah, yeah. yeah. um and the reason, and so I, I thought about that too, and the, one of the reasons I did not put that in there is because we also, which I, I did not know, but we license vending machines. Yeah. Um, I did not realize that, yeah. but uh, vending machines, I don't know if you've known this, but sometimes the food gets stuck and people shake them yes. and they fall and actually injure people. Those yeah. do not require to be bolted down either. Um, so it, to me, it was more of like a consistency thing, but if we really want that, that is something we can add. So. That, so that was considered to more than, you know, yeah. one so would think those it would be considered. changes at your direction. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to make it, I want to be clear, I don't want that ad additional don't tip over thing to make this harder. I want it to make it where people have less to complain about. Yeah. There you go. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Councilman Mahal. Were, were you done? I just, I just wanted to bring up one other thing yeah, that we ahead. had all talked about in that... Um, Human Rights Commission. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
about the Good Samaritan Food Donation Act of 1996. So mm -hmm. with that, how would any of us be liable, city, the people that are putting the refrigerator out, anyone, how could we be liable for anything? That's, so that's kind of what I talked about earlier. And there's actually a state statute as well. So anyone who is watching or wants to know, it's Title 76, Section 5.6, Food Donations, Civil and Criminal Liability. Um, but I won't get into that one because it's a little bit different than the federal one. Um, let me get that one pulled up here. I thought I had one. <laughs> it's like the one statute I guess I didn't print out. But from what I remember from looking at it, uh, under the federal statute, basically it protects certain types of people. It only protects people who donate. It may not necessarily protect um, the businesses who donate. And I think I got that from, if you look at the, oh, I think it's like de the Department of Agriculture. They have a, or Consumer Affairs or something like that. They had a like FAQ sheet, and that's one of the things that if you are donating it, it may not apply. Or if you are the, the, the supplier of the donated food, it may not apply. So that's kind of a, a tricky little issue there. I don't think it's been, you know, very much, it hasn't been litigated, I don't think. I couldn't find anything on it. So there's no, like, court the donation in, exception? Huh? The donation exception? Um, the Bill Emerson Act of 1996? Yes, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I looked at that one, and there is some uncertainty there on whether or not the person, like, the premises supplying the food that's going to be different than the person who donates the food to your local food bank, for example. So, yeah. But you don't know for sure. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I'm. I, that's pretty much the understanding I got from the federal guidance and the reading of the statute. I'll double check after this and make sure, and I can send out if something is different than that. Councilman Bell, yourself. Um. <clears throat> so. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank Mr. Purinton for yes, um, yes, yes. pretty much dropping what he was doing to attending to this. <laughs> and I think it's really been, um, I, I have been deeply involved in this issue since June. And so it's been really interesting to learn, um, you know, how this concept has evolved in the first place and, um, you know, how these are operating around the country to meet um, food insecurity and food deserts that we certainly can identify here in Norman, both those things. And um, the fact that in Oklahoma, and I think what you said is we don't have any municipal ordinances to look at or to consider. We are, we are doing the work. Yeah. Well, that's nationwide. That's not just Oklahoma. Yeah, like, that's what I yeah. thought you said. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, not only are we doing groundbreaking work in Oklahoma, but, you know, we may be we may be um, a model for other communities looking into this. And so one of the things that I want to make sure, or that the way I've been thinking about this, um, number one, um, you know, there were several different um, volunteer and advocacy groups that started this idea here in Norman, and um, they went through a considerable amount of steps to try to be intentional and think about, you know, how could they operate and how could they do it safely because obviously the last thing that they want to do is harm anyone who's using their food <laughs> or taking their food. And so um, this, uh, there's only two community refrigerators that I am aware of that are operating in Norman. There could be more that we just don't know about, mm -hmm. but there are two that I am aware of and um, I think they both have, you know, we're operating for at least, um, in one case, at least six months. The other one, I'm not sure what the time period was, but really operating without complaint. And so one of the things that I really want to make sure that we separate out is um, since we are writing an ordinance and we don't have any real model to follow except our good sense, is that we create a policy and we create an ordinance that is not specifically addressing the two community refrigerators that we know about right now, but that we're building good policies so that we can allow not only the, one, the people who are currently doing this kind of work, 
but that we're creating a policy that is going to open up a pathway for other people to be able to operate too and that we're consistent in what our expectations are. So um, I also am really interested in um, pursuing the right-of-way issue. I know um, that what we used literally was the Boston Toolkit, um, which is a set of guidelines. It's not ordinance language. I'd also like to point out that the city of Boston has a whole department of food access yeah. <laughs> that does lots of other things, but um, they're the department within the city of Boston that created um, the guidelines. And like you said, they do have multiple refrigerators operating. They do seem to have some level of success um, in being able to do that without, you know, complaint and all those sorts of things. And so we really did look at this for a lot of guidance. And so that's where the private property piece came from. That's where um, the, um, you know, not allowing these sorts of um, community refrigerators to operate within the public right of way. So that's where we were looking for guidance. And I just think it's important for everybody to understand where that's all coming from. And um, so I think uh, in response to what the issue is that we're trying to address, this is the first step mm -hmm. of looking at the ordinance language and kind of that broad structure of um, solid policy going forward to allow um, the exception because that the unattended refrigerator really was the code compliance issue yeah. when it came right down to it. It was not about right away necessarily. It wasn't, there, there were a lot of things we thought it was about, but it really came down to the unattended refrigerator thing. So we are accomplishing that initial goal of addressing the exception to um, you know, not being in compliance with section, is it 204? 204. 204. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got that sorted out. I really think, um, you know, all of the guidelines that you've set out as far as um, just basic things that would be consistent for anybody, either now or in the future, that wanted to do this, I think these are reasonable expectations to um, expect from, um, you know, a volunteer organization or a business or whoever wanted to do it. And I'm pretty confident that, you know, the two refrigerators that are operating, that these are already things that they are yep. doing. Mm -hmm. And so um, we know that, you know, they can be successful in doing that. So um, I'm, I'm comfortable at this point with the, with the ordinance piece of it and moving forward. I think, you know, the other part of it is um, the whole issue of the right of way. I really would like to know a little bit more about um, is the sidewalk cafe permit is that, are we comparing apples to apples with tables versus an appliance? Maybe we are, maybe we aren't. I don't think you've really had the time to even take a look at that quite yet. Uh, I mean, from what I'm understanding, it's not gonna be apples to apples in terms okay. of at least the fire code, right? Yeah. Because like on the one hand, if you're talking about safety, one is movable and one is not in case of an emergency. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, I haven't had the time to like, you know, go through that, yeah. you know, big stack of fire code provisions to yeah. really see like if that's going to be that big of an issue. So, I mean, there's just a lot to untangle in that knot mm -hmm. and it's going to take time. Yeah. So. so I also just want to really be careful about, um, trying to, um, I mean, obviously the people that are here know that I fully support the work of the re resonator, um, and United um, Uprooted and Rising um, group that's put so much work and effort into this. Um, but I think we have to be really careful about, um, you know, again, a policy that we're comfortable with to allow others to operate as well and not to focus on a certain part of town yeah. or a certain street or a certain, you know, I mean, this needs to work for our community to meet the need of the community and not be created just for a particular situation. So that, that's my concern. And I, you know, I, I want to make sure we understand um, that we are providing a path to operating a community refrigerator and not, you know, making it as easy to do as possible while also, you know, um, having certain community standards that I think we all expect and they're already doing. Mm -hmm. That's not the issue. That's mm -hmm. never been the issue. No. 
So your um, definition of good policy, I think, is dead on point. It should be as you, you you know what's good when it is universally applicable. Yeah. And and it's not oh well this situation is a little different so we need to rewrite or have two policies. Mm -hmm. So totally on board. The one piece that we will have yet to tackle was on Anthony's first or second slide yeah. where it talked about conflict. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that is yet to be addressed. Yeah. So um, so far on the streetery side, haven't really had any calls for neighbors not happy with what that neighbor chose to do in front of their business. Mm -hmm. In this instance, we know there will be because we've already received those calls. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's something that we'll have to tackle. And that's what I, I hope we can achieve is um, as a council supporting a policy that addresses the community need that is being met by mutual aid in Norman currently. Right. There are a lot of things on the books for the future for more permanent food pantries that are going to involve commercial refrigeration, separate buildings associated with other nonprofits that are already doing work to address food insecurity. So, you know, I, to me, all of these things just need to fit together. So that's really where I am. And I just want to really, um, you know, express my appreciation to um, everybody on the staff who's been addressing this and trying to find a way forward and is, um, you know, as quickly as we can. But we know that, you know, <laughs> we, we, we can't just wave the magic wand and make it all, you know, work out. But I think, you know, we really have tried to put this on the front burner and fast track it and address all the concerns. I appreciate you you know, inviting the stakeholders to actually have this discussion with you before rather than after. And so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged at, that we're, we're off to a good start and we can address some of the other things. And I, before you have to go, uh, I did find the Bill Emerson Act. I, I did print it off. I knew I did. Um, <laughs> of so course you did. <laughs> here's the th so there is a liability for the person who donates. But it extends, li uh, it extends liability to nonprofit organizations, which we would not be considered under their definition. So we would not be covered under the bill, Emerson. I had one other, just a really technical question. Does it, um, for the permit where you have to have the approval or consent of the property owner, if there is a lessee and a property owner, do you need that from both parties or does that depend on the lease? Um, well, you know, I think that's a, technically as it's written, I think there really is a lessee needs it from the property owner. You only need the acknowledgement from the property owner. Okay. But there's gonna be some like lease issues if it's the property owner wanting to do it, do it over the objection mm -hmm. of the lessee, so. Yeah, because again, I wanna be thinking about this in the long term. Yes and not where we are at the moment because property owners are pretty stable, I mean, mostly stable. Who leases the property is a much more, yeah. um, mm -hmm. you know, that turns over a little bit more frequently, for, I think for the most part. Is yeah. that safe to say? That may not even be a true statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Okay, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Good job. Councilmember Tortorello. Hey, um, you guys all answered my question. Mm -hmm. I was ready to come here and say this is the most <laughs> ill advised project here, but I'm amazed by the synergy of this group that figured out everything I was going to argue against. <laughs> really, sincerely, that you did a good job on this. And so I want to let you know that here. And, and um, I'm surprised I agree with all this. <laughs> <laughs> I never doubted like this. Wait, wait, okay. <laughs> I'm not that hard. Bad heart or, or hard heart of a guy here. I understand about our unhoused citizens, mm -hmm. and we have to look out for them mm -hmm. because it's our job and responsibility here. Mm -hmm. But the eyesore that some of these refrigerators have, you know, and the biggest complaints I have. There's only two. The biggest complaint I have was the homeless and the hanging around and sleeping around there. And, and I had the same questions you had, Lee, about the right of way. Mm -hmm. We need to work that issue out there. And, and, mm -hmm. and the apples or oranges, you know, refrigerators and appliances versus the, uh, the tables, totally different thing here. But, but pretty much I think we're on the right path to, to looking at the issue and, and figuring out a problem or, and, and, you know, actually looking at the problem and finding a solution to that here. So I just want to let you know that you took my questions. <laughs> you took my questions. <laughs> and you closed. I thought I'd raise my hand first. I don't know. I thought I'd <laughs> so, so, um, 
My every, left eye is not so good. Every, what's that? So my left, my left eye is not so good. <laughs> do I need to sit over there? Sit over here next time. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do, do the point. The point. Well, I did this. I was like, this. I had my pen up. <laughs> but, but, but you did answer. You guys all answered my questions that I was going to ask anyways here. And, um, you know, I think more and more that um, as this team is developed and growing, that um, we are looking at the big picture of Norman. And so I just want to let you know that. And with that, I'm out of here. i got to go pick up my daughter. I have just I'm one more comment, if you don't mind. Okay, go ahead. That's what settling. No, I did. I did. <laughs> the kids leave. Uh, I just want to say a couple things. So first, um, I do, I agree that this should be for the whole community. But I also think that it's important to note that location is very important. Oh, I understand that. So having something that's centrally located that a lot of people can have access to is very, very important to me. I understand that. Um, and to important people that to need to be able to get around to get to these things. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to say that. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up is I know you had mentioned about it being private. Mm -hmm but non-residential. So can you expand on that a little bit more? Because to me, if I'm a homeowner and maybe I live close to Main Street and I want to put one up since I can't have one on Main Street right now because of the sidewalk thing that we're trying to figure out, why am I as a private property owner then not allowed to have a refrigerator on my own property to do what I want with? Well, How are you allowed to tell me that as a... As well, currently we already do that. Um, technically that 204 also applies to private property. So you can't have a beer fridge on your front porch. So but if I if I if somebody's always at my house uh -huh. and I'm stocking that refrigerator and I can see it, it, it it's not unattended. Uh, I mean, you know, at three o'clock in the morning, um, when it's outside, you know, I think that's where it gets a little bit more into the unattended territory. Okay, but now that we're writing this ordinance and we're saying yes. mm -hmm. private property owners. So. Well, and, and why can we not include so this, this, there's, there's lots of layers in this one. When we talk about the zoning ordinance and um, occupancies, the hierarchy of zoning ordinances are all designed to, at the very end, protect the quality of life of a single family home. Okay. So everything you do, you, 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 we work and when you go to school like Jane and they teach you all this kind of stuff, whatever you got to do in your zoning ordinance to make sure you don't have a heavy industrial user right next to a single family residential unit. Uh, there's anticipated traffic flows, both foot traffic and automobile traffic in single family residential zones. And if you put this attraction on your front porch and now you've doubled the amount of foot traffic in my neighborhood, the neighbors will say you have negatively impacted the quality of life because now there's all this new foot traffic. So. Typically, it's it's a much easier argument to make in a commercial zone to say foot traffic is what it's all about. We right. want to increase mm -hmm. foot traffic mm -hmm. in commercial zones. You may not want that same increased foot traffic in that residential zone. So the, it, you would look beyond just this ordinance and that code enforcement language all the way down to your zoning ordinance to say, let's talk about occupancies and... You so. explained that much better than I could. It <laughs> has been asked to me a couple yeah. of times by a few different people, so I just wanted no to make problem. sure that we had that on the record as the why behind it. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, the, uh, and the only final comment that I have that um, Councilmember Tortorella raised, I want to make sure, because I know a lot of people, you know, probably will be listening into this. So both of these community refrigerate refrigerators do not just serve those that may be unhoused at yes, the moment. Yes, thank you. Yeah. That was um, <laughs> they serve um, a lot of people in this town that have been impacted in negative ways by a pandemic, by lots of other circumstances that you know are individual to each person, but there are plenty of people that have been <clears throat> benefiting from our food pantries, our community refrigerators, that uh, are housed, <laughs> that have other circumstances where they do not have the food that they need at the moment. And so it's serving a lot of different um, groups in Norman. So this is, uh, I just wanna make sure that everybody understands that food insecurity and food deserts apply to a significant portion of our population and is not focused on just those who may not be housed at the moment. Thank you. Not to mention food swamps. 
There's a whole other layer. Mm -hmm. And then perfect timing for the meeting to follow. There you go. You nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just wrap up by saying thank you again to Mr. Purington for uh, you know, expiting this and fast tracking mm -hmm. it to make it a priority. I, I know it is a priority to a lot of people. So yes. um, thank you again. And yeah, this meeting is adjourned. Well, so we love a new iPad. So yeah, oh yeah, way easy. I mean, I was gosh, just thinking two phone calls on the phone. A lot of grocery stores. Oh, yeah. Got cellular. So. Uh, yeah, and we were thinking uh, day only, but I didn't have access. Uh, maybe a good call from. Well, it's a beauty of our